Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dor, um, and uh, Glover and I will be introducing Scylla Open Source 3.0. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Scylla 3.0 marks a significant milestone for Scylla. It's really a packed, feature-packed release with uh, lots of them, and you're going to see them all, and we're going to discuss them and have a Q&A at the end. Uh, we're very excited with uh, Scylla 3.0. It's almost fully on par with Cassandra. In many aspects, goes what beyond Cassandra has to offer. And as you, you're going to see, we're targeting not just the Cassandra database, but uh, a, any other NoSQL technology. So it's more than just Cassandra. Um, so I'm Dor, a CEO and co-founder of CitaDB, uh, an engineer and a snowboarder, not necessarily in this order. And uh, together with me today, we have Glover Costa. Glover. Hi, everybody. Uh, and I would like to welcome you as well to the webinar. I am Glover Costa. I'm the VP of Field Engineering at CitaDB. And what I do here is to join our engineering organizations to the needs of our customers and vice versa, and making sure that those things are working in harmony. Thanks, Glover. Um, I believe that by now, uh, all participants do know uh, what CillaDB is, uh, but uh, I will spend a couple of milliseconds about it. Uh, Scylla solves real-time big data problems. So uh, if you need to access your data in a real-time latency, meaning uh, milliseconds of data, single-digit milliseconds around this time frame, and also you have a lot of data, not a small data set that can fit into an old relational data database, but a very large one that needs multiple servers and needs uh, the best high availability in the market. We believe that we're the most suitable solution among uh, other solutions out there. Uh, we're dropping replacement uh, for Cassandra, and in general, you can expect uh, the rule of the thumb uh, around 10x performance gain. Your mileage may vary, it can be uh, three, 3x to 20x. It really depends on the, the scenario, the use case, and, and your hardware. We recommend uh, a, a good scale up hardware with uh, plenty of CPUs. And in general, the rule of thumb is that uh, first you need to um, apply your uh, replication model and high availability requirements. Then you do the maximum scale up and only afterwards you do the scale out. And you can scale either up to uh, the record is 384 cores or scale out to 1,000 machines. It's all options are on the table. Uh, recently, we uh, launched the Scylla Cloud. It's a managed service on AWS today, later on other clouds. It's a fully database as a service, so it joins the offering of uh, a full open source or enterprise or now Scylla Cloud. And uh, without further, further ado, let's dive into the uh, content of the webinar. So we're going to discuss the new feature set in Scylla 3.0. Uh, and, and there's plenty of features and we'll go one by one and, and eventually uh, summarize it uh, with what's coming next beyond uh, Scylla 3.0. There's plenty of things that are coming. Um, so let's start with materialized views and uh, Glober, um, let's, uh, I'll hand you the control and you can drive from here. Thank you. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah. Uh, so the first feature we're going to discuss today are materialized views. Materialized views are a feature that we are shipping with Scylla uh, since earlier versions in the 2.x series, but they became uh, fully GA now in 3.0, ready for prime time. Materialized views are a feature that are useful when you want to query your data in a different shape or in a different form uh, with, with uh, potentially a subset of the fields or all of the fields organized in a different order and etc. If you don't have materialized views, uh, what people used to do before this feature was available is just manage a lot of tables yourself. So if you have, uh, as this example here, I have a table of buildings, uh, and I want to know the name of the building, like the Empire State Building, the city in which the building is present, uh, the year in, in which it was built, and its height. 
Uh, this supports uh, some forms of queries. So for instance, name is my partition key. That means I, I can query buildings by name. It's going to be inefficient to query by anything else. So if I want to query by city, for instance, and I don't have materialized views, every time I do an insert, I would have to insert in two different tables or three different tables uh, to get my data available in different shapes. With materialized views, the database does it for you. Uh, so when you insert the data, uh, we're going to do a read before write. We see uh, what's the current state of the data and keep those two tables in sync. Uh, syntactically, again, we are the same as Cassandra, so you can see an example in there. Uh, I'm creating a materialized view. It's called Buildings by City. And I want to insert, I, I want to have all the data that I had before, all the columns. Uh, so the query is select star from buildings. I'm really getting all of the, the fields. Uh, but I want to reorganize this in a different way. I want city now to be a partition key to support the queries in which I want to uh, ask what are the buildings in, in this particular city. I could have clustering keys in different order than the original table to support the descending versus ascending queries. Uh, I could make clustering keys into regular columns and vice versa. So it's really like a way to see my data in a different shape. We can see a real example in here uh, with, with mock data from what will be in a table like that. Uh, once again, I have a list of buildings and I, I know that the Empire State Building is in New York. I know that the World Trade Center is in New York. The Salesforce Tower is in San Francisco, uh, so on and so forth. I, I, it's very hard for me to query buildings by city in that table. But if I have a materialized view, now I can have queries like the ones you see above, like give me one building in each city. So I'm doing like, uh, give me all the information about that building, limit one. Uh, but I really want to query by city now. So that is now possible uh, with a materialized view on top of that table. So one interesting thing about materialized views is that obviously we don't want to sacrifice the availability that your rights have. Uh, so Scylla follows a consistency level uh, a model for selecting the consistency. I want to write you a number of replicas, usually three, and I want to hear from one, two, or all of them before I can consider uh, this write successful or maybe none of them. Uh, when, when materialized views are in play, what happens is that now I have to go to other replicas because I have a different key. So the data will not reside in the same, in the same node that my base data resides. So I need to uh, go and consult uh, other nodes to make sure that this query is written. In order not to sacrifice the availability, what I want to do is make those updates asynchronous. Uh, so I will acknowledge that the, uh, uh, the query was successful. I will acknowledge that I successfully wrote the data into this table. And I will mark this materialized view update to be done later. And those things will be eventually consistency. This way, I'm not impacting the availability. So I'm, I shouldn't be impacting my throughput too much. Uh, the latency of, the, of, of your write is also not sacrificed because as soon as the base table is updated, I can already reply to you and say, this is a successful write. Now, there are problems with that, uh, is that maybe I'm doing writes too fast. So I'm writing too fast to my base table uh, and I cannot possibly, in some circumstances, depending on your hardware, on your network uh, and your node power, I may not be able to keep the updates on the materialized views going as fast as I need to. Maybe, for instance, you have 20 materialized views in one table, which is a scenario that we've seen, and you cannot update those things fast enough. Uh, so what Scylla does uh, is instead of leaving this to the client, this is in the spirit of what we've been doing with Scylla since the beginning. Instead of pushing this to the client, instead of letting you, the user, uh, play with rate limiting and concurrency controls, Scylla will automatically uh, put back pressure in the writes so if we detect uh, that this queue is growing too large, if I detect that my view updates are falling too much behind, I will start automatically delaying your writes. Uh, so we're also bringing uh, all the self-tuning capabilities of Scylla to the materialized views features. And with that, you shouldn't have to worry about memory exhaustions, node overloads, and etc. cetera. Uh, here is one example of a simulation that we have while developing this feature. You have one replica that is, much, uh, that is a little bit slower than the others. Uh, that means that the updates to that replica will take longer. 
Scylla will just automatically delay the base replica so that those things become automatically in sync. Another feature that we're bringing to Scylla 3.0 is secondary indexes. Secondary indexes actually look like materialized views to some extent, and this is no accident. I'm going to delve deeper into that uh, later on. What you can do is that you have a table, for instance, very similar to the table that we had before. I have the same buildings tables with name, city, built, and feet. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to just be able to query uh, by some other column, either a clustering key or, 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 or a regular column. I don't necessarily want the full flexibility of reorganizing my data. Uh, I don't want to replicate all of my data. I just, have really, I just want really to create an index in this additional column, in this case here, CD. So I'm trying to achieve the same result that I had before. I will create an index, uh, and now I'll be able to do queries by CD. That looks a lot like materialized views uh, can do, as I said, and, and the reason for that is that we actually implemented the secondary indexes features on top of materialized views. So as you can see here, we are, we are transparent about it. When you create a secondary index, what it does is that in the backgrounds, it creates a materialized view. If you do a describe schema in your cluster, you will see that materialized view. Uh, and, and then uh, what you see there is essentially the, uh, the materialized view table that supports the secondary index. This happens transparently to the application. You don't need to know that the materialized view is there. Uh, you can still query your base table uh, and just add a query by CD now. But under the hood, Scylla will direct that query to the materialize view. One advantage of doing things like that is that now my secondary indexes are global instead of local. So you can see here, for instance, that when I query uh, select uh, the buildings where the city is New York, uh, I know that there is a secondary index. So I know there is a, that generates a materialized view table. So I can go to the view replica. This is error number two in this, feed, in, in this figure and say, hey, give me all the buildings that are in New York. So that comes back to the coordinator. The coordinator now knows all of the buildings. Uh, and, and just as a reminder, uh, I don't have all the fields in, 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 in that replica. I just really have the index. So I now query my base table, knowing what, the, what, what those buildings are. So I get, now I get all the data that I want from the base table. I just know exactly where to look because the materialized view told me that. Uh, this is very scalable because uh, regardless of how many nodes I have in my cluster, maybe I have a thousand nodes or two thousand nodes, I'm still only stressing uh, only those three nodes. And if, in the case the coordinator is the same as one of the view replicas or base replica, maybe just two nodes are participating in this query regardless of the number of nodes. Uh, so this scales uh, very well with the size of the cluster. In terms of syntax and, and what you can do, like our secondary indexes are exactly the same as Cassandra. So if you have a Cassandra application, uh, this application will still work with Scylla. Uh, you can still create the secondary indexes the same way, uh, but they are global instead of local. And uh, you can see a summary of, this, of the figure we had in the previous slide here uh, in the left. This is the global index, the way they work. Uh, the indexes in Cassandra not being based on materialized views, they are local. Every node indexes its own data. So when I want to do a query like this, I need to go through all nodes and ask them, what do you know about uh, buildings in New York? Can you imagine what happens, for instance, when you have a thousand nodes in this cluster? So that doesn't scale very well. Uh, that's why we opted uh, for global secondary indexes in Scylla. So uh, although we are API compatible, the implementation uh, is very different and we believe more scalable. Now we saw that secondary indexes and materialized views are very similar in what they do. They essentially are solving the same problem but in different synthetic ways. So it is a fair question to ask, when should I use one versus where should I use the others? And materialized views are way more powerful. They, they allow you to reorganize your data in whichever way you want. Uh, so in situations in which you really need that control, uh, you are going to go for a materialized view. You're not going to use a secondary index because their syntax do not offer you the power that you need, for instance, to revert the order of your clustering keys or to, to, to select a subset of the keys and et cetera. 
Uh, if I am querying a materialized view, this is an explicit creation of an explicit table. I know that table exists, so I can go and query it directly. I don't need to use steps as we saw in the case of uh, the secondary indexes. So in some situations, this will yield a better read site latency because I, oh, I can go and query directly that table. Now, secondary indexes, on the other hand, uh, they have this two-step uh, query that we saw in the picture. I go query the view replica, and then I go with that information and query the base replica. Uh, so, but what that allows me to do is have seamless integration with the base table. I don't need to specify a second table. My application doesn't need to be aware of a second table. And all of the features that will work with the base table, all of the queries that will work with the base table, we will still work with secondary index. So we can use other parts of the infrastructure with secondary indexes because of that. One such example is allow filtering. So you can now do filtered queries and take advantage of secondary index because they are transparent. And speaking of allow filtering, though, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, thanks, Glover. Um, by the way, I think that uh, your sound sounds a little bit distorted, so worth to uh, get the microphone near your uh, mouth. Um, so another just thing before allow filtering, uh, both uh, secondary indexes and uh, materialized use became GA in Scylla. Uh, after a long bake off as experimental features, usually we try to be uh, conservative as possible and introduce new features as uh, experimentals. And only after they get baked and uh, after they are used by uh, a cutting edge users, uh, only then we define them as uh, GA level and general available. And there are still a couple of uh, uh, improvements that are planned for materialized views especially improvements around uh, throne control. It's really complicated uh, area. We, we solved some of it and, and uh, still we expect to, to improve the flow control. And uh, the base and the view are automatically synchronized. Uh, if you compare uh, using materialized views, it compared with uh, user-based denormalization. Uh, but we do need to still solve the problem of uh, repairs with uh, the base and the view. This will c come in the, the future release of Scylla. But it's generally available and we do recommend users to use them. Uh, allowed filtering gives you another a powerful option. A, a usually you, you'd like to build an index or, or materialized views for queries that you often do. Uh, allow filtering is uh, maybe uh, something that is done less uh, less often and it's when you need to uh, go through a big set of data and usually you you may not have an index for it and uh, before allowed filtering you had to uh, just do a full or partial table scan and do the filtering on the client side which is uh, relatively heavy uh, a allow filtering uh, term allow the server to do it on the server side so it's way more efficient than doing it on the client uh, you must add allow filtering uh, at the end in order to be because it's a heavyweight operation and this uh, kind of uh, protects you from uh, overloading the server just like that so only if you add allow filtering uh, it, the server will do the uh, uh, the filtering on itself and it can scan full tables so in this particular example of the same table as before uh, you want to scan the buildings but you, you want to select only uh, buildings that uh, were built in a particular year uh, inside new york city so Scylla will go over the entire table uh, all of the the rows of the tables and uh, filter only these results for you so uh, naturally it's a very heavyweight operation uh, you can read more details about allow filtering in the link below. We'll share the, the slides so we, you'll be able to, to get to it. It's, it's, uh, a, we blogged about uh, secondary indexes, materialized views, filtering, and pretty much every other feature. So you can get uh, in-depth view and not just be satisfied with this relatively short presentation. Um, so th this is allowed filtering, but the nice thing is it's, uh, it allows you additional flexibility. Uh, if you already have an index, like uh, you have here an index on the city, 
So uh, allow filtering will, will work more efficiently. So the same query as before to filter for uh, the city of New York and buildings that were built in 1934, will now work way more efficiently because uh, we have an index to the city and we can just uh, go through all of the, uh, the, the, the index New York and just go through all of the rows that uh, have buildings in New York City. So uh, the, the difference will be dramatically dra dramatic. So uh, uh, just have this in mind and th this is a really good capabilities. And we tested that on a data set of uh, I don't know exactly what's the size of it. Uh, uh, several gigabytes, maybe to uh, um, two terabytes. And uh, this query, uh, when there are no indexes, took 11 minutes. And uh, on the same data set, when there is an index, it took only sub seconds. Uh, it still needs to go to, and, and to filter all of the New York buildings, but uh, a way, way more less amount of work. So that's allow filtering and uh, you are recommended to use it. Um, let's move on to another feature, which is more for uh, in performance improvements under the hood. Uh, it's improvements of uh, range scans. Uh, again, you have a link to the blog, which is super uh, in-depth and interesting. Um, it's related to um, uh, filtering and indexing because uh, uh, the optimization is about to uh, cache more when you do range scans. Uh, normally, uh, when you access uh, Scylla, then and you if you read a lot of data, then the uh, results will be paged. So uh, you won't have uh, gigabytes of uh, or megabytes of results. You can page them. So every time. Uh, the user, the client side will, will get a page size uh, of data, uh, process it, and then the client will send uh, the request for the next page using a cookie that will indicate what was the last status that the client read. And, and this uh, works for standard queries, not, not necessarily range scans. Uh, with uh, range scans, it gets way more complicated because uh, it's not necessarily just one node or one coordinator that needs to be involved. It uh, can be multiple nodes that are sharded across the cluster because you're scanning a range or maybe the entire table. Um, and uh, every time that uh, we need to fill a page, then uh, we do not know how much data every shard holds. So we need to actually query the shard, get the data, and then a return the page. Now, you, uh, if we'll uh, read too little amount of data, we'll need to uh, come back to this shard frequently with a lot of round trips, uh, so that will be, won't be efficient. On the other hand, if we'll read a lot of data, then we, we, we read too much and we'll need to redo it in the next uh, client page request. Uh, so it's kind of complicated. And there is a lot of room for uh, improvements and, and caching and uh, tuning and adjusting the, uh, the amount of red, uh, red data, lots of room for strategies. Yeah, so th this is exactly what we've done in 3.0. We, we improved these aspects. Um, and it even gets more complicated with Scylla because in Scylla, the data is sharded across the clusters to nodes. Uh, each node has multiple ranges. Uh, They're defined by the V nodes. Each V node has another level of uh, a, of structured uh, by the the, uh, the node shards. We have two level sharding, so uh, the data is also of a specific range within a, a single node is also is also sharded. There is uh, across CPU core zero, CPU core one, et cetera. And uh, before 3.0, we used to read them sequentially because we didn't know how much data to read. And uh, the, the, the problem or the, the optimization that I uh, described before, we, we read it sequentially, and this creates like a long uh, a ping pong or type of uh, of, of, of uh, pattern. Now we improve the situation and within every 
every node, we query the shards in parallel. Uh, and we have heuristics uh, that, that knows how much data to query, and it's actually adjust itself in runtime. So it's learned uh, how much it read in the previous time and know uh, to, what to aim for the next time to, to read more data or less data. And we have a combined stream that uh, orders all of those shards uh, together in the stream to the client because it needs to be in sequence. So super sophisticated. Uh, th this is what's under the hood. And uh, again, the user doesn't know, know, doesn't know and doesn't need to know anything about it. Uh, we're just sharing the uh, underlining implementation. And this is under the hood. Under the chassis, actually more things are done because uh, we need to have uh, per core control within every node. We need to have per multiple nodes control, like, like the, the global shards. And uh, there's even a uh, heuristic where uh, the both the, the client needs to select the same coordinator, which is given, but also the coordinator uh, have uh, multiple replicas that it can access, and we also try to uh, access the same replicas that uh, were accessing the previous query in, in order to uh, use the previous caches. So we, we keep live all of the uh, data in streaming, the data that we've read in the previous uh, query from the disk, so it will be cached and performance will be better. So lots of improvements were done. And the results are great. Uh, so the results here are normalized. Blue was uh, Scylla 2.3 and uh, red is uh, Scylla 3.0, normalized to 100% of what it used to be. So you can see that uh, CQL re reads, now you can do around 35, 37% more reads than you, you, you could do before. Uh, and uh, the disk accesses the amount of byte thread per CQL read operation is uh, dropped by 35% uh, as well. And uh, the disk IOPS operations drop by around uh, 65%. So very big uh, improvements for uh, range scans, full scans, and uh, everything related to it, paging as well. Um, so let, let's transition to a, a different uh, area where we, we had uh, implemented the feature which was long anticipated, uh, the, the, the Cassandra 3.x uh, most up-to-date file format. Uh, a little bit of uh, history, uh, uh, we launched the Scylla beta uh, in 2015, uh, in September 2015, long, long ago. And at the time that we developed it and launched it, uh, it was the time that uh, the Cassandra project uh, were developing uh, a, the, the new RSS stable format. And it, since it was an interim period, uh, it turned this way that uh, our, the representation of uh, CQL operations uh, and uh, objects in RAM was matching the, the CQL language in the best way. And the disk representation was actually the old structure. Um, so we were compatible to an older Cassandra format. And finally, we implemented, uh, and it's a, a GA ready to the Cassandra 3.x format, and it's fully compatible with Cassandra. So it's a, it's a very good addition uh, to us, and it's easy for migration and improved performance, and I'll cover it. Uh, the great thing is that, uh, uh, unlike Cassandra, if you already run Scylla uh, with the older format, uh, it will automatically upgrade your SS tables. So, but no, without doing anything and without running any migration tool, uh, we'll migrate those uh, older SS table formats into the newer one, just like that. Uh, we have compaction that runs in the background, so you'll got you'll need to wait for compaction to run or trigger manual compaction, but there's really no need to trigger that. Scylla will just catch up automatically and uh, move those older files to the new file format. Uh, we, we, we are still conservative, and although it's uh, generally available, we wanted that 
only users that uh, are interested uh, in it will, will uh, need to do some action and enable it by a, explicitly by turning a flag. It's, it's uh, just to be on the safe side. Uh, but next release uh, will flip the, the flag and uh, it will be enabled for everyone uh, by default. Now, um, let's cover the major differences uh, between the old format and the new format. So the, the old format, uh, usually if you know the SS table, how the SS tables files are, look like, they have a, a K, A, or K, other letter, and LA, in other letters, uh, suffixes on, a, on a, for the files. So the, the main caveat was that uh, a, there was no knowledge of rows. Uh, it's, it's more of a, a legacy of uh, the thread format where you had partitions and cells a, and, and no rows. Uh, in, in the CQL format, you have partitions, a rows, and cells. Uh, and the, the, because of that, every cell a, had to duplicate a lot of data. And specifically, cells used to have the clustering key value along with the column name, and the column name was just kept for every cell. So not, not just the cell value, but the actual column name, which was next to every cell. So in this example, three times, but it can be a billion times. So naturally, very, very inefficient in terms of uh, storage, it has also implication in terms of performance. Uh, the new format, uh, there is a notion of row, so we can extract the, the column name and uh, put it in the, in the metadata uh, separately in a statistic.db file, and uh, this way no need to have this duplication. Uh, Besides duplication, so now it's way more aligned with the CQL format and uh, also metadata is not kept within the data file. Uh, we had we, uh, it comes with additional improvements, uh, especially around uh, compression, uh, variable side integers, a uh, compression uh, algorithm is implemented, and also database timestamp encoding, and uh, every cell has a timestamp, so th that's big saving. Um, so at the end of the day, it allows you to significantly uh, reduce uh, your volume size, a process data faster, uh, backup and restore are also become friendlier because they become independent of the schema, and uh, migration is now even trivial than what it used to be, and we support multiple options of migration. That that's a, can be the source of a complete separate uh, webinar, but uh, you can migrate from Cassandra using the Cassandra files, you can you have a sustainable you can, Cassandra snapshot, you can have a sustainable order, we can even have a Spark tool that uh, can read a live Cassandra cluster and migrate it to a, to a Scylla cluster, variety of options. Also, you can migrate back as well, and could be with uh, some processing if I'm not mistaken. And now, in, in terms of uh, how much uh, space is uh, saved, uh, uh, so it, and the answer is depends. Uh, and as you can see in these examples, uh, I thank the SILA engineers at uh, keeping everyone more honest uh, than the Pope. Uh, and they gave an example where saving is practically minimal or uh, neglectable uh, in some cases, but in some cases it can be very significant uh, up to 3x. Uh, it really depends on the schema and the data that you save. So if you, we use an example of a very key value type of a schema, um, as I said before, the main source of duplication is the column name. Uh, so the, the, it mainly depends on the ratio of uh, the column, the cell value and the cell name. So if the value, for instance, is uh, way larger than the cell name, then let's say, uh, for value here in the table, it, 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 here it's text size. Let, let's say it's uh, 10K of text for every uh, cell, then value has just three letters in it. So it's three letters that we save versus uh, 10K of data. So saving will be uh, minimal. But if it won't be the same case, but if uh, the uh, length of text uh, is only a couple of, uh, uh, characters as well, then the saving can be 2x, 
in, in this particular case. Uh, in this example, it's more apparent uh, how large the saving are, and this is a little bit more complex uh, uh, table. And let's say, let's pick on humidity uh, uh, from the table. So humidity has uh, around eight characters, uh, but it's represented by an int. So uh, the, the it's like a one-to-one -one saving, and that's it's you can see that it's being reflected as 80% uh, saving in this particular case. Um, so that's the uh, new SS table uh, format and uh, let's move to some other uh, improvements. Uh, Glover, go ahead. Thanks, Dor. So another thing that we did in Scylla 3.0 that I would like to talk about is improvements to the streaming process. Now, streaming isn't new. We do streaming since the first version of Scylla. And what streaming is, is actually any operation that has to transfer data from one node to another. This could be because you're doing a repair, or this could be because you're adding a node, removing a node, or etc. So the way streaming used to work in Scylla is that we had RPC calls between the nodes. And those are standard request response kind of RPC calls. Uh, I can, this allows us a great flexibility, so that's why we chose this as a way to do this in the first time around. Uh, I can just uh, send all the messages to the receiver as if they were normal inserts. So for the point of view of the receiver, there isn't really or there wasn't really a lot of difference between the inserts that you're sending or the updates that you're sending uh, versus the updates and inserts that are coming from a foreign node. Once those updates uh, reach this node, I still have to go uh, with them through mem tables and then write them into SS tables because of ordering. I need, of course, those SS tables to be sorted. Hold on, I got it. All right, I'm in control again. Yeah, so uh, what we did in Scylla 3.0 is that we revamped this mechanism and instead of having this request response RPC call uh, in, uh, intermediating the access, within the nodes, now we, we have an RPC streaming interface. So I just open a stream in the other node and I send my data. Because of that, I can guarantee that the data is sorted and I don't have to go through the usual write path with mem tables, SS table writers, and etc. So that obviously makes uh, streaming a lot faster. We took this to a test and uh, you can see the results. Uh, if you wanna see the details, they're in the blog that we quote in the bottom. Uh, uh, we took an, an, a cluster of three nodes that had around 2.8 terabytes of data spread across those three nodes. And um, what I'm trying to do is decommission a node uh, in the first example. So all the data that I have, um, now I am sending to the other nodes. Uh, and you can see that Scylla 2.3 was already plenty fast, especially if you compare it to the other databases uh, around there. Uh, we were doing this in give or take 900 seconds. Uh, pretty good result for this amount of data. This obviously was an isolated test where everything was idle. Uh, it will take longer in practice, but, but even then, like a pretty good result. But still with Scylla 3.0, uh, this is taking below 700 seconds for a 22% improvement. Uh, we see similar improvements, 16%. If I'm adding a node to this cluster, uh, and, and even if I'm adding a node, which is the more interesting scenario, uh, during load, while your load is running, uh, it's not a crazy amount of load, but I still have some background load there. Uh, I'm, I'm still like 13% faster than I used to be. Uh, and mind you, this is obviously a, a, a very simple test in the same data center, uh, in, in the same uh, rack. So the, the ping time between the, the, the nodes is not uh, completely crazy. If you do a similar test like across continents, uh, a response request protocol will perform much worse and the streaming in that case like among data center is supposed to be a lot faster. So this is essentially what we did in terms of streaming. Next feature that we brought into uh, Scylla 3.0 is uh, hinted handoff. Uh, and hinted handoff is a feature that allows nodes to be kept in sync more easily. In, in the case that one node cannot communicate with the other. Now that can happen for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, it could be because you took a node down for a maintenance upgrade, you're restarting the node to upgrade its kernel, or maybe you have intermittent problems in the network. For one reason or another, you might not be able to communicate. Uh, there will be differences across the nodes, and what Hinted Handoff will do for you in this case is it will minimize the differences uh, among the nodes without the need of, of doing a costly repair. So you can see how the mechanism works uh, in, in this example. Uh, and, and mind you, this also uh, was already present in experimental form in 2.3, but we made a GA much like the other features in 3.0. So in this example here, I have a client that is writing to three replicas. Uh, so it's a normal replication factor of three. Uh, he receives acknowledgement from two nodes, so he considers the write successful. Uh, this is, for example, a quorum write. Uh, and he doesn't really know at this point what happened uh, with the third node. Maybe it was successful, maybe it wasn't. Uh, in this example here, uh, it wasn't successful. We will consider that the node X was down. Uh, once more, it could be because of a network failure, uh, or it could be because it just took the node down for maintenance, or this node had a temporary problem, etc. So what is going to happen before hinted handoff is that this node will not have the most up-to-date data. But with hinted handoff, what the node does is now knowing that I could not write to that node, I will write a hint. Uh, so a hint is essentially a reminder to myself that I still have to replicate that data to this other node uh, at a later time. And as soon as I detect that this node came back in line, I will go ahead and I will replay that hint and now all the replicas will be in sync. The reason this is much faster than a repair, of course, is that I don't have to scan all the data uh, I, I don't have to go through all of the data fixing all the differences that I that I know about. I already know about this difference beforehand, so I can go directly to that key and fix it. Uh, the way the read works is that if I if I need to read a quorum from, from those nodes, for instance, at any point in time, of course, uh, that's what quorums are for, you are still going to be consistent. In one node, I'm going to read the most up-to-date data. In the, this other node, I will see that the data is not up-to-date. And at that point, uh, Scylla will, uh, as it always did, uh, it will conciliate this data and it will reply to the client uh, the most up-to-date data. But before it can do so, it obviously have to figure out which, the data, which of the two pieces of data is correct and then fix this difference uh, at synchronous time. For this reason, hinted handoff is also expected to give you a performance boost because if you don't have, uh, if, if the amount of differences, if you, can, if you can fix the differences faster, that means that during your synchronous read path, uh, you're gonna have a latency advantage. There's no da data to be conciliated. So it took this for a ride as well. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, this graph uh, shows me the amount of read time synchronous conciliations that are happening. So every time that during a read, Scylla detects that there is a differences and have to fix this difference before returning to the client. In 2.3, I don't have hinted handoff enabled by default. Uh, and, and during the write phase here, the node, for instance, was coming up and down. Uh, so there is some data that is missing in one of the nodes. Uh, as I conciliate the data, as you can see, uh, obviously this data will eventually be all in sync, uh, but during the read that uh, immediately follows the write, it's not. So I have all of those conciliations that are going on. In Scylla 3.0 we've hinted handoff. In this scenario, there were no conciliations to be made, uh, and of course those reads are going to be much faster. We also have a full blog about it uh, that I invite you to read in details. But in this test, for instance, I could see my 95th percentile latency going from five milliseconds to two milliseconds once more because I don't have to do this conciliation at read time no longer. This is a 60% advantage. Uh, other percentiles like the 99 and the 99.9 .9 also saw improvements, 62% and 10%. Uh, so this can also be seen uh, as, as, a, as a performance feature in the extent that it reduces the amount of work that the server has to do uh, during repair or during read uh, synchronous conciliation. This is the last feature that I wanna talk about in terms of what we did in 3.0. So I'm gonna hand off to Dor uh, after hinted handoffs so he can tell us a little bit more about what's coming next. Thanks a lot, Glober. Um, so I hope uh, this, this release content satisfies uh, many of uh, our users and customers. Uh, but certainly th this is uh, just a point in time and there's so many things that we'd like to do beyond this. Um, so let, let's talk about what's coming. Uh, 
So first, uh, uh, we need to launch the, the next enterprise release, which will be based over the open source release. Uh, the timeline for it is uh, two months from now, the, around the end of March. And the idea is to rebase it over the, the current uh, open source release and to add a couple of uh, enterprise only features. Uh, one of them is uh, encryption addressed uh, that, that some enterprise customers need with uh, a KMIP um, a key, key management solution or with uh, just plain, plain a key files, depending on you. Uh, the exciting pair user SLA uh, a capability that uh, we talked about at our summit, and, and you can go back to the summit to, to see what it is about, but basically it allows you to run multiple workloads on the same Scylla cluster and have isolation between real-time workloads and more for batchy workloads that are usually originated by uh, analytic workloads. And so you can have the two coexist. And uh, lastly, there is a, a long anticipated uh, new compaction strategy. Uh, still supports uh, four compaction strategy in the uh, OSS version, com fully compatible with Cassandra. Uh, we discovered, uh, we had an idea how can we combine the size tier compaction together with level three compaction strategy because the first size tier uh, allows you to have good performance and the rule of the thumb is to use size tier. But the caveat of it is that uh, you need to have a 100% uh, free space for compaction to run. And that's sometimes uh, a large price to pay. On the other hand, level triggered, uh, you need only to have 10% of your storage, uh, of, your, of your storage to be available, which isn't much, but on the other hand, there's a, there's a lot of uh, write amplification in order to do that. Uh, incremental compaction uh, combines ideas from both and allow you to work within a 10% free storage, uh, but not have as uh, rigorous um, amplification as, as level triggered. Uh, so this is coming in the next enterprise release. Uh, beyond this, we, we continue with the, uh, the release train and uh, the next uh, open source Scylla will be 3.1 with uh, some of uh, my materialized views, uh, a, a improvement uh, with a flow control improvement uh, with an improvement uh, for uh, SS table indexing. Uh, this is something that we haven't gotten to implement yet. We, we, we've done over the course of the past two years, lots of improvements for uh, wide rows, but what's left is the uh, to make sure that the indexing will be accessed not through a serial scan, but through uh, a, a log scan. Uh, and this is uh, the last uh, thing to complete uh, that uh, the, the CILA, uh, the, the Cassandra 3.x uh, format allows you. And that's coming in the next release, uh, which will, uh, will come around uh, two, three months after CILA 3.0 as well. Um, uh, we're working on lightweight transactions, so I bet uh, people already ask about when will lightweight transactions be released. Uh, finally, after a long time that we hold work on LWT, mainly to deliver uh, a ver stable materialized views and secondary indexes and other features, now finally we have the time to work on it. We believe that it will take around uh, uh, and, and six month uh, ish can be even sooner, can be later. Uh, it's a feature that needs to be tested for a great deal of time. So th that's the expectation. So maybe around th 3.2 or 3.3 depends on the amount of releases that we will be able to push. Normally we're trying to push uh, to have uh, a fast pace release cadence. Uh, but sometimes as we add more feature set, things get more complicated and we always want to have a stable release. The, the, the newer release needs to be uh, better than the old one. So sometimes uh, reality slows us down. Uh, so that's uh, about LWT, again, around six, six month time frame for now. 
we, we have lo long, lo lots of plans around the LWT beyond, uh, a, beyond the standard feature. We want to use it for internally to improve uh, a schema agreement and a bunch of other ideas. Uh, next thing is Scylla Manager. So uh, uh, we, we haven't announced it publicly yet, but you can just use Scylla Manager even with the open source uh, release up to five nodes. And it also comes from free for with the enterprise release. Uh, Scylla Manager 1.3 added, uh, Scylla Manager basically it's a, a management console that eventually will do full life cycle management. Uh, we and it will combine and the monitoring stack into it. Right now, it's separate, and it, it started. We started it with uh, doing automatic repairs, uh, and it can do automatic repairs to multiple Scylla clusters, and and uh, you can control the granularity of repair on a per node, multiple nodes, a regular expressions uh, to select nodes and select them to control data centers repair. Uh, we added a cool health check in Scylla Manager 1.3 that uh, health checks individual nodes and, and C with CQL and measured latency. Um, so 1.4 will add backup and, and restore, manage backup and restore. Uh, another uh, released uh, component is Scylla drivers. Uh, currently, we do not uh, release them in binary form, but we will over time. Right now, you can just download them from GitHub and we have a Go driver and a, and a Java driver. And the main difference between them and the, the Cassandra uh, drivers, which they're based on, is the uh, a internal shot per core basis. So that they manage to distribute the, uh, the data better and, ma and make all of the shards operational together. And lastly, uh, it's not what's coming, but uh, it's already, uh, is out there is the Scylla Cloud. If you want to have a fully managed uh, solution, it's already up and running, and, and we're excited to have the uh, the new customers already uh, using it. And it will improve and add uh, VPC peering and uh, multi data center in the upcoming month. And so that's pretty much it. And we can do some Q and A. Um, so Glober, how about you pick one question and I'll, I'll do the next. And I'll take your, leave my remote control. Uh, I'll just leave, allow me to abort control and then you can pick a, a Q&A. Exactly. I wasn't, I wasn't able to click on the Q&A without gaining control uh, of your, uh, can you give me a terminal with root access while you're here? <laughs> So, uh, okay, uh, so we have, a, we have a question here about materialized views. Uh, let me start by answering that and Dory can chime in as well. So the question is, will this, uh, by this I, I expect you mean like the process of uh, writing to materialized views, will, will this make the base table write slower? Uh, and, and the simple answer is no because as I discussed in the beginning, uh, the updates to the, to the replica are asynchronous. Uh, however, it can be the case that uh, the system is just not able through to, to your hardware or et cetera to handle all the view updates. Uh, if that's the case, the skew of asynchronous updates will grow and grow and grow and grow and eventually any system would run out of memory. And then what Scylla does is automatically slows you down if you hit a resource situation. So you will be as fast, you still will be as fast as your hardware and your setup allows you to be. Uh, and if a flow control does not kick in, meaning that your hardware is still under limit, uh, materialized views are not gonna slow you down in any way because the updates to materialized views are asynchronous. And um, I'll chim in just to add potentially more clarity. I'm not sure about the exact question because Every write now to the base table needs to be, there, there's additional data that needs to be uh, written to the view table. So that's more work for the database. Now it's, it's even worse because uh, we need to read the data in order to uh, get the full row and figure out uh, where to, we need to use some other uh, 
in, in the view table, there's an, another partition key. So we, we need to figure this out. So a, a write is actually first we need to, to have a read and then we need to write for the base and also write for the view table. And that's done for every, ta every view. So there's more work that for the Davis to do. Yeah, uh, you already started actually to answer the second question without your knowledge, which is uh, how does the materialized review refresh work? So uh, why don't we expand on that a little bit? Or, or maybe I'll read you all the materialized view related questions uh, and, and we can, because uh, we have this one, how does the... Refresh or... Uh, yeah. Uh, so the one question is, how does the materialized view refresh works? And the second one is, can I join two tables to create materialized view? So uh, we can answer them as one, I think. Go ahead and answer, Bobber. Uh, so the, the, the refresh process is, is what Dor just explained, essentially. Uh, uh, you, you have to do a read before write. Uh, you have to understand what's in this table and what needs to be updated. There are also uh, there, there are corner cases that the materialized view has to handle uh, with, uh, with nulls and et cetera. Uh, so definitely it puts more work into the server and, and every time you write to the base table, that refresh will happen. Uh, that will trigger reads, that will trigger more general work into the server. The other one, which is, uh, can I join two tables to create a materialized view? No, uh, the materialized view is something that is per table. Done. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the jo the join capability, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, more of a long term, uh, th th there is a SQL join, and that's a, a way longer term, and I won't commit to it. But uh, I'm interested to add kind of a flows to the system where you can you can do multiple activities, and you can uh, like a pipeline them. Uh, it's something that uh, some other databases do, and that's uh, a desirable uh, thing. It's, it's more of a, a, a one-time operation. It's not an operation that, uh, like materialized view, happen under the hood for every time you, you get a, a, an insert or, a, or an update. Uh, next question, or uh, answer that. I think that is more of a question for you. Can we expect a full enterprise version of Scylla with full stack suite of connected technologies like Graph, Message Broker, Solar, and etc.? It still can be connected, but would be nice to have one final solution, one full solution. Sorry, like uh, DSC. Um, so the, the 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 simple answer is. Uh, uh, yes and no or uh, n n not now. Uh, what we're, we're trying to do with Scylla is to create the best score uh, as possible. So we, we focus not on necessarily on of breadth of features, but on depth. And we make sure that the features are stable, are fast, a, are fully satisfying, and you can scale them in, in a relatively a not costly fashion, pretty much the opposite of uh, of other solutions. Uh, it comes with a cost that uh, we can't do it all or we cannot glue solutions together. Uh, for Graph, there is Janus Graph and many users and customers use Janus on top of Scylla and it just works. So um, I think it's a, it's a good, uh, a, we may over time uh, think about uh, providing an enterprise release for Graph. So far, many users just use Graph uh, off the shelf and they get support for Scylla. So that, that's, uh, a, that's a good combination. Another thing that I do many times do not like with uh, a, a, a combining multiple solutions together is that uh, every, th every uh, component need to scale differently. So it's, it's wrong to run on the same machine to, to run Solar and Spark and Graph all together because maybe your database needs uh, 10 nodes and your Graph needs 20 nodes and your Spark needs uh, uh, 15 nodes. And, and over time, and this is, can be the starting point, and over time, the, uh, the requirements for scale will be different and it's really bad. Just think about how much nightmare is it 
to tune a JVM, now you need to tune uh, three JVMs, four JVMs, or it's the same JVM, but uh, has multiple usage, so it kills the garbage collection tuning. So I think it's uh, a wrong choice uh, on, on one hand. On the other hand, so graph, for instance, should be a separate component. I would love to, to uh, support graph, and we may do it. But, but again, uh, many users just use it today. Regarding uh, other technologies, uh, a, our, a, for search, we do not think, like solar, for instance, is just a glued solution because uh, they have a separate uh, write path and a separate read path, and uh, DSC just combined the two. Uh, it's not fully consistent, and uh, if there is a failures, then the failure characteristics of uh, Solar and uh, Cassandra are different. So it's glued together, but the, the it, I don't call it a satisfying solution, although it is simpler, so I can't ignore that too. And at the end of the day, it depends what you need to do. Our recommendation is to use the best of breed and use Scylla for real-time database and Elasticsearch for search today. Uh, there is a nice path with uh, SASE indexes, which I would love to take and to implement them natively within Scylla. And this way, Scylla will provide full text search uh, within the same core product. Uh, this will take uh, a long while to get to, but th this is uh, uh, more aligned with, uh, with us. A uh, similar thing is uh, streaming where we, we would like to uh, implement CDC and we'll do this uh, this year, capture data change. And by doing it, we'll be able to uh, expand towards more streaming options. Um, so I hope that uh, answers it. It's a long <laughs> answer though. So uh, I'll, take the, I'll take the next one and is uh, AWS tends to limit local NVMe SSDs to two terabytes in order to reduce up cost and compute. How we reduce number of Scylla nodes, handle large amount of data that originally existed on Forex Cassandra nodes without sacrificing local SSDs. So I don't think this is a, an accurate representation. Uh, Amazon AWS has instances with 15 terabytes of, of NVMe disks. Uh, those are the instances that we usually recommend with Scylla. Uh, either the, the largest ones, for instance, in the i3 family. So what usually happens is one of the advantages is that if you are coming from a lot of Cassandra nodes uh, to a few Scylla nodes, uh, you, you pick bigger machines. And those bigger machines, they will have more compute power and also more SSDs. So I think you were right in the sense that, yes, the data, if I'm, if I'm consolidated, I, I can be bottlenecked in storage, so the data has to fit. But I don't think this is accurate that AWS limits you to two terabytes because our customers run 15 terabytes instances. Uh, and and so this is common practice uh, with Scylla. Also, the, the amount of uh, data per node is expected to grow by uh, all cloud providers. Uh, the disk uh, density automatically grow and the amount of disks. Uh, and also Scylla is uh, constantly improving the the RAM to disk ratio. So uh, it's, it's pretty much aligned with uh, the industry direction. Uh, okay, so there is another one that we answered already, which is uh, does Scylla DB allow table joins? The answer for that is unfortunately no. Dor did uh, uh, mention that in his previous reply. Uh, another one is with regards to the base table size, are there limitations in choosing materialized views? Uh, and secondary indexes. I am guessing that secondary indexes are more scalable. So, Dor, if you want to comment on that. Um, so, there are no limitations in size. And so, b both work. But basically, uh, is secondary indexes are implemented over materialized views. So, I highly recommend we, we have a blog around about it, and, and we'll also refresh this blog. So you're welcome to read about the implementation of uh, secondary indexes. Uh, so uh, basically a secondary index uh, goes to a separate materialized view table, collects the index and go to search for the original full column. So pretty much they're almost the same implementation plus additional logic within the secondary index. 
so they're, they're both uh, actually materialized views are a little bit uh, will 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 perform more and uh, in the differences Glober uh, gave an example for the two so if you read the materialized view you just need to read the view and that's it in one operation if you need to read an index you need two operations so materialized views are actually faster uh, but but they don't have any limit on performance because it's another regular table and all tables don't have a practical limit. Uh, next question, you mentioned about transaction. Is this feature going to be like our DMS solutions like MongoDB's multi-document support? Uh, so I don't think uh, we're gonna get there at least in the first interaction. Uh, lightweight transactions are supposed to just uh, mimic uh, what the Cassandra API provides, uh, which is essentially a distributed compare and swap. Uh, I personally do think that uh, this is an interesting direction, but uh, it's not a direction that we are in the short term. Um, there's more than that because the the the, uh, the roadmap for uh, lightweight transactions is first to implement uh, a single partition and then to go to multiple partition. Uh, so it will be like uh, the, the multi-document support. It's not, but, but Mongo isn't exactly in, in our DMS type of uh, a relational database. So it's more still a lightweight, but, but uh, we'll go and do multi-key uh, transactions. And uh, if you see the trends in the industry, then in, in parallel, it's, I think it's very important to have both transactional and non-transactional accesses. Uh, sometimes uh, there, there's specific tables that needs transaction guarantees and you wouldn't like to use a different database for it, uh, unlike, unless it really makes sense to it. Uh, uh, we'll never have the flexibility of a standard Oracle database. We, we care about performance a lot. Uh, so it's, it, uh, it, it depends on the use case, but we're trying to, to uh, have the best performance possible, but we will add more and more transaction guarantees over time. And you will have uh, still in this year, you will have uh, a mul multi-key transactions. Uh, let's answer a final one, Dorp, because uh, we are eight past the hour. So uh, when can I filter data by the field of my custom uh, customized data type in a query? I uh, want to pick it. I'm, I'm looking for the, the question itself. So uh, want to answer it? Go yeah, ahead. I don't, I don't, to be honest, I, I'm not really sure what's the exact question here. Um, maybe, maybe we can write this one in writing afterwards. Uh, there are two more that I don't think we're going to have time. Uh, so what we did in previous webinars is uh, we will follow up uh, with uh, the answers to mm -hmm. all of those questions. Yeah. Maybe we can do more research at that time and try to mm -hmm. understand better what that means. Yeah, if it's about uh, user-defined right. types, then I think that uh, they're probably filtering uh, them may not have the, uh, allow filtering may not be as flexible and may not look into your user-defined type today, maybe in, in the future, yes. Um, and uh, pretty much th that's that's the case. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think that by customized data type, the user does mean user defined types. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm not and sure we're, though. We're we're adding user defined uh, functions, so maybe that will come into play, but uh, not in Silo Fido th th yet. Uh, you're welcome to email us additional questions or ask for clarif clarifications. And in this point, uh, I'd like to thank everybody and thank you, Glober, uh, and thanks for our hosts. And uh, go ahead and download the release. Uh, it's waits for you. Go ahead and test it yourself, provide feedback, and uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your time and listening. Bye-bye. Thank you all for coming. See you next time.